I'm Nicola Courtright. I teach the history of art at Amherst College, and I'm also uh, the vice chair of the ACLS board. I'm so happy to be moderating this session because we're really hearing the results of the latest scholarship with some very uh, interesting, astoundingly to me, imaginative scholars who show the direction really interdisciplinary, all three of them, direction of scholarship in the humanities. And we're so proud that ACLS has been able to sponsor them. I think you'll notice that uh, in contrast to last night, we have a different gender picture here of the ACLS. Uh, and uh, I think it was an accident. Uh, so, but it's, it's worth noting. So, the first speaker, and I'll introduce them uh, one by one. So Sylvia will first speak, and then I'll introduce the next, and so on. The first speaker is Sylvia Hodling, who received the 2014 Mellon ACLS Dissertation Completion Fellowship. She did what she was supposed to. <laughs> she finished last week. She defended last week. And I've learned that yesterday she was awarded the Francis Blanchard Best Thesis in the History of Art uh, for her dissertation at Yale. So that's a fantastic <laughs> honor. Congratulations. <laughs> Sylvia, uh, like all three of these uh, speakers, has a variety of backgrounds. Her BA is actually in history and literature. And she has an MPhil in history from Cambridge. But then she went on in art history with a dissertation entitled Politics, Poetry, and the Figural Language of South Asian Textiles, circa 1600 to 1730. So she's really mixing together in infinite ways that she'll tell us about the, the different cultures and different responses to cultures of this particular time in Islamic and European cultures, a really interesting thing. So, um, She's going to be, next year, a fellow at the Metropolitan Museum. And she's going to, after that, begin her tenure track position at Bryn Mawr in the history of art and early modern art. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you so much, Nicola, for that generous introduction. And I want to thank the ACLS, the board, the staff, and fellowships committee for the generous grant that allowed me and gently encouraged me to finish my dissertation. Um, and I also want to thank you for the opportunity to p participate in the annual meeting today. All right. Around 1610, a merchant or nobleman in southeastern India wrapped a monumental textile measuring eight feet tall and 23 feet wide around the perimeter of a high-ceilinged hall. The textile, now held in the Brooklyn Museum and divided into seven hangings, depicts a chattering world framed by lobed arches and topped by onion domes. It is a world populated by South Indian women and men in saris and opened neck shirts, by hunters in leaf skirts, by Javanese dignitaries with fin-shaped head ties, by African musicians, by European traders in ballooning breeches, and Persian or Turkmen noblemen in jamas that cross at the chest. For early 17th century visitors to the nobleman's home, the hangings depicted the faces of figures that had become familiar in coastal South, in South Asia through the maritime trade in things like nutmeg, elephant tusks, rubies, saltpeter, and stallions. If the figures represented a compendium of visitors, however, the hangings also were windows into the worlds clad in Indian cloth. For in their geographic diversity, the hangings uncannily represent the far reaches to which South Asian cotton textiles traveled in the early modern period. In the 17th, 16th and 17th centuries, cotton textiles from India flourished as a bartering currency at Southeast Asian spice markets in present-day Indonesia and Malaysia, where they were bought for use as hip wrappers and to decorate ancestral homes. 
They were tucked into linings for Japanese robes and spread out as prayer mats in Iran. In the latter half of the 17th century, European merchants began trading in this painted cotton cloth that they called chintz. By the 1680s, the Dutch and English were shipping home a combined 8 million yards of cotton cloth from India. Europeans lined their, uh, their rooms in the cloth, as can be seen in this wonderful Dutch 17th century dollhouse. They covered their beds and their windows with cotton chintzes, which bore exotic floral patterns and bright dyes, creating an immersive, colorful, and easy to clean environment. Studies abound in economic history about the global trade in Indian textiles that flourished in this early modern period and explore, as one title puts it, how India clothed the world. Recent museum exhibitions and art historical scholarship have borrowed from the economic model, studying the aesthetic dimensions of a world interconnected by the textile trade. This understanding privileges the far-flung sites of consumption. Coastal South India, where these objects were made, recedes from view. With the turn to transnational histories and studies of mobility, there is a temptation to follow the freely moving polyglot objects of this long distance trade. Yet if we do so, we can also overlook the encounters and translations and cosmopolitan cultures of the sites of production. It is challenging to find honest ways of describing intersecting networks, like those of the 17th century textile trade. The frame of reference must be flexible to comprehend networks of differing scales, allowing us to find agency in small and large events, in artistic practices and long distance trade, in minor fluctuations and broad trends. In my dissertation, I have come to argue for the eloquence of these cloths as evidence of a burgeoning worldwide trade, but also as documents of both artisanal and courtly life in transition. I have sought to situate South Asia not only as one of the great producers and exporters, but also as a heterogeneous mix of consuming cultures with a unique sensibility about textiles. I aim to probe not only the economics, but the poetics of this coveted commodity. This talk will have three brief parts. In the first section, I will discuss the coastal ecology and art artisan practices of southeastern India that made these vibrant cloths. The second section examines the poetry of cloth in 17th century South Asia. The third concluding section offers a single silk robe that was sent as a gift from the imperial court to a regional ruler, an object lesson in the inseparability of the small and the large, the so-called local and global. To make a cotton textile, like the monumental Brooklyn cloth, raw cotton grown in the Deccan Plateau of central India with its rich black earth and lower humidity was transported to the eastern Coromandel coast of India, brought in bales across the craggy landscape by thousands of bullock. The cotton moved into the homes of spinners and weavers where it was untangled using a shark tooth comb, spun using a hand mill instead of a spinning wheel, and then woven to a standardized width. After bleaching in lime and sheep's dung, the, the cotton fabric was distributed, along with the patron's patterns, to painters who used a reed pen to paint the cloths with dyes. The knowledge of painting cotton with a reed pen and dyeing with vegetable pigments was passed within families occupying painting villages and was tied to certain ecological factors. And I'm showing you here contemporary images, not to suggest a sort of continuous um, tradition, but, but to give you a sense of how of the, the sort of making of these objects. Um, the northern Coromandel grew the best che root, which produced the red pigment the seashells lining the region's inland rivers increased the calcium content in the water, deepening the vividness of the red hue. Pomegranate rinds produced a deep mustard-colored dye, but could also yield green in the pistai or pistachio color. The use of local dyes blurred the boundary between body and clothing, between the skin and the second skin. Indigo was used as a hair dye, in addition to serving as a blue textile pigment. Henna, best known for dyeing hands, feet, and hair, also imparted a deep orange dye to cotton. Turmeric produced bright yellow dyes and was and continues to be a regular ingredient of South Asian cuisine. The special alchemy of water composition with dye materials was not always translatable. 
We marvel at the distances that these cloths traveled along maritime trade routes, forgetting that 17th century cloths moved much further than their human makers because artisans and their material conditions were more fixedly tied in place. However, European merchants in India from the period assumed that artisans required, quote, only a shady tree to work under and conspired to collect cloth painters from their villages to work at factories located by ports. Within the English East India Company letter books, there are repeated calls to entice the superior northern Coromandel Coast painters to come south to Madras, even though the Che route was inferior and the waters were brackish and unsuitable for the dyeing processes. Hidden in these records, I found one artisan, a master cloth painter named Kalahasti, working in Madras, whose name suggests that he traveled eastward from his village of Sri Kalahasti, one of the only villages still known for its cloth paintings, and that's actually the image that I showed you before is from Sri Kalahasti. The precision of the dyer's craft and the painter's materials I have just outlined dramatizes the moments when artisans like Kalahasti did move. In their figural and decorative motifs, these cloths articulate most fully the human mobility and the human costs necessary to produce a world clothed in Indian cloth. To my second point, if we look only at the distant exports of Indian cloth, we miss out on the cultural, metaphorical, and art historical meanings that cloth could have. The word chintz, which referred in Britain to a painted or printed cotton, and has given us our dismissive term chintzy for something tasteless or gaudy, originally comes from a Hindi word which means spotted or sprinkled. The word chint appears in a common form of poetry from 17th century northwestern India that used mnemonic devices to help youthful merchants remember the properties of cloth traded throughout South Asia. To evoke chintz meaning as a, cloth, as a cloth sprinkled with design, the writer of one of these poems places the cloth in the context of Holi, the springtime festival when lovers and friends playfully toss powder or spray colored powder at one another. The couplet reads, it was the month of Palgun, the spring season when her spouse arrived remembering their old love. He playfully sprinkled chintna, colored water on me, and my companion sang teasing songs. Built into the couplet about chint cloth is the idea of memory, of the spouse being reminded of his old love. Through poetry, cloth accrued familiarity in the cultural memory. Chint cloth became lodged in the mind when it was imagined wrapped around the body of a beloved. Other cloths that appeared in northwestern India bore poetic names that evoked the regions where they were made. The recorded name for various muslins, or mulmuls, the finely woven cottons made in the eastern region of Bengal, corresponded to different climatic conditions. There was an evening dew muslin, muslin, chabnam, a woven air muslin, baftana, and a running water muslin, ob i rowan, creating a palpable link between the feeling of wearing these cloths and the humidity of the region in Bengal where these cloths were produced, a climatic condition quite unknown in dry desert Rajasthan. One of the most startling objects I encountered in my research is a woven silk coat that was sent from the Mughal Emperor Jahangir, who rule, ruled over North India, to Raja Rai Singh, a regional Rajasthani ruler in Bikaner, in, in the Northwest in Rajasthan. The cloth to make this coat, once vibrant, lac red and indigo blue, was woven in Iran. In Mughal India, it was the most expensive imported textile in this period, far surpassing in value Venetian velvets, Chinese satins, or Flemish tapestry. The object also suggests that the man who received it, a regional Hindu ruler who read Sanskrit and spoke an early form of Hindi, was nonetheless a participant in the far-reaching Persian-speaking world that stretched from the western reaches of the Ottoman Empire through to Southeast Asia. The robe signaled Raja Rai Singh's inclusion in the Islamic practice of gifting a robe of honor, or khila, as a sign of allegiance between a ruler and a vassal. The woven scenes on the cloth depict two lovers, likely Leila and Majnun from Persian romance poetry. They are staggered in pairs by the weaver, seeming to pine for one another from kitty corner open windows. The two separate rectangles of Persian text come together into a couplet, it is as if life is blown into this image. It has become the gatekeeper, Pardadar, of Khusro of Iran. The inscription suggests an animacy to the robe. The word used for image, surat, 
is both a portrait and an actual face. The second line re references the materiality of the cloth, for the word gatekeeper, pardadar, literally means holder of the curtain. It is a term that refers to the emperor's trusted confidants at court. The robe thus references its own role as a khila, or ro robe of honor, and as a garment that embodies, through Persian tropes, this local ruler's allegiance to the king. Beyond its worldly symbolism, the robe has a wonderfully concrete history as well. An adjoining communication that came with it in November 1597, preserved in Bikaner, suggests that this robe was given in exchange for a cheetah. Apparently, Raja Rai Singh had an excellent cheetah, Nilkanth by name, that Emperor Jahangir requested be sent to the imperial court. He was fond of using them for hunting. As though to make up for the loss of Nilkanth, the letter then states that a private cloak, this one, has been sent with the messenger. This silken coat speaks to what is actually a common phenomenon, objects that simultaneously carry both a transnational genealogy and a local history, objects whose social lives cannot be seen as a linear narrative that moves from global commodity to intimate belonging, but that retain both qualities at once. Textile history is rich in the themes that are becoming central to humanities today. Textiles trace out global histories. They are complex in their materiality. For studies of mobility, textiles are the perfect medium because of the ease with which they can be rolled up and unfurled in new environments. Yet the local histories of textiles have also challenged me to expand my humanistic approach to include not just the visual history of cloth, but the whole sensory experience of textiles the way that they retain scent, the texture of satin or crepe as it wraps around the body, the rustling sound of silk taffeta. Textiles surpass other media in the intimacy of their use and the direct, their direct address to the senses. They are the kind of textured observations that I worry I would have missed if I had been looking only at global networks on their vastest scale. Finally, there is a political and ethical dimension to studying the life of textiles beyond the long, beyond the long history of long-distance trade. At the height of the Industrial Revolution, Britain began exporting cheap machine-made cloth into Indian markets, causing Indian cloth production to fall by 40% between 80, 1850 and 1880. We cannot comprehend the iconic imagery of Mahatma Gandhi at his spinning wheel, nor understand why his adoption of cloth making was the ultimate symbol of his non-compliance with the British Raj, without the backstory of what cloth meant in South Asia in the early modern period. Contemporary events, and in particular the collapse of the Rana Plaza textile factory in Dhaka, Bangladesh in 2013, have brought the dark side of the textile history into the news. Last year, clothes at the British discount store Primark began appearing with desperate pleas for help, putatively embroidered by garment workers onto labels that usually coldly read, made in Bangladesh. Though the labels were likely the work of British activists, the labels bear some distant connection to those resonantly named muslins that I showed you earlier. Textiles made by the world's finest spinners and weavers in Dhaka in the 17th century. When the fine cottons from Dhaka were consumed in other parts of India, the women who wore them knew they were putting on a bit of Bengal, a shimmer of evening dew. We could do worse than to revive this ability to imagine the figures with which our fabrics are imbued. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. We're going to hold all questions till the end. Right now, I'd like to introduce Grace A. Musila, who is senior lecturer in the English department at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. She was our 2011 Humanities Program postdoctoral fellow and completed her postdoc in 2000, or took the postdoc in 2012 to 13. With this postdoc, she spent two months in Ghana and the rest of her research time in South Africa. She's working on a book uh, on the 1988 murder of British tourist Julie Ward at the Maasai Game Reserve in Kenya. She is, in fact, uh, completing the manuscript of this book, and I believe it's going to be published in October. Am I right, Grace? So uh, like uh, Sylvia, 
Grace is widely interested in studies of, of varieties of literatures as well as popular culture. She's gonna tell us about that. And understanding how different narrative tropes act out in this relatively recent uh, tragic cultural event that she sees through the lens of multiple populations, I believe. So can't wait to hear it. Thank you, Grace. Come on up. Thank you for that wonderful um, introduction. It's a great honor to be here today, and I'm grateful to the SCLS and the African Humanities Program for the opportunity. I'm particularly proud to be an AHP fellow, and my hope is that one of these days, someone will do a book on the rich networks of multidisciplinary and cross-generational research conversations across the continent embodied by the AHP family. So as you heard, my background is in, Afri in literary studies, primarily African literature, and I'm going to share with you a few ideas from a book project that I'm about to complete. The book will be published in October by Boydelon Brewer, and I hope that my presentation today will persuade most of you to get yourself a copy once it's out. <laughs> so perhaps the question we should start with is, who is Julie Ward and why am I writing about her death? Julie Ward was a 28-year-old British tourist who traveled to Kenya on an overland group trip in 1988. After a few months in Nairobi, she drove to the Maasai Mara Game Reserve on the 2nd of September 1988 to photograph the annual wildebeest migration from the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania into Kenya's Maasai Mara. On the 6th of September 1988, she was reported missing. Six days later, that's on the 13th of September, her partly burnt remains were found in the game reserve. Only her jaw, left leg, and skull were recovered. The rest of her body seemed to have been incinerated. The first autopsy by the Kenya police pathologist, Dr. Adel Shaker, revealed that the remains had been cut using a sharp implement and that there was a subsequent attempt to burn them. For him, this pointed towards murder. But the chief government pathologist, Dr. Jason Caviti, altered Dr. Shaker's autopsy report. Dr. Caviti's alterations appeared to validate the Kenya police's official position that Julie Ward had been attacked by wild animals or possibly struck by lightning. <laughs> the lightning theory was first put forward by a British intelligence agent based in Nairobi, and we can talk a bit about that during um, discussion time. So the Kenya police officer assigned to the case, Mr. Mushiri Wanjau, concluded that Julie Ward may have committed suicide. Two decades later, Wanjao would tell the Ward family that his initial investigations had pointed towards murder involving a key politician's son, but his boss, the director of the Criminal Investigations Department in Kenya, had instructed him to, quote unquote, look elsewhere. So these sets of ideas by state officials suggest Kenya's keenness on certain versions of truths regarding the case, all of which excluded foul play. Eventually, an inquest was held in 1989, and it confirmed that Julie Ward had been murdered. Subsequently, there were two murder trials. Uh, sorry, subsequently, there were lengthy investigations by Kenya police and British investigators from the Scotland Yard, resulting in two murder trials. The suspects, as three Maasai Mara game, res game wardens, were all acquitted due to lack of sufficient evidence. Julie Ward's killers are still at large as we speak, and the investigation continues, largely led by her now elderly father, who's in his 80s. So faced with the reluctant Kenya and British state institutions and outright attempts to cover up the truth, he not only had to finance the investigations right from the moment his daughter disappeared in the Mara, but he also had to spend a lot of time personally carrying out and overseeing investigations. So Julie Ward's death is a subject of three true crime books, The Animals Are Innocent by her father, John Ward, A Death in Kenya by an American journalist named Michael Hilsig, and both of these two books are published in 1991, and Darkness in Eden, published in 1994 by British journalist Jeremy Gavron. In Kenya, the death captured the local imagination, resulting in rumors and speculations regarding the possible involvement of a prominent Kenyan politician. <coughs> The case also attracted significant media attention in both local and international print media. Apart from these sets of texts, a 1989 film titled Ivory Hunters 
and a 2001 novel which might be familiar to many of you perhaps in its film adaptation that's a constant gardener, show striking resemblances to some of the versions of speculations about the murder um, which prompt me to use these materials as well in my work. So my book is about versions of truths and fictions in the Julie Ward case as articulated in these narratives. I'm interested in locating the place and meanings of these murder in Kenyan and British social imaginaries. I argue that the readings of and inscriptions on Julie Ward's death and life become important windows into British and Kenyan imaginaries on a wide range of issues, including race relations in post-colonial Africa, wildlife tourism and conservation, perceptions of female sexual moralities, the workings of state power and transnational capital, among other issues. Now, the narratives on the matter challenge, modify, reinforce, and discard key assumptions on these issues, allowing for rich glimpses into the processes of knowledge production and contestation in contemporary Kenya. So my book is interested in three major concerns. Firstly, I'm interested in how narrative works as a critical intervention in understanding social reality by not only mediating reality, but also attempting to influence its meanings and interpretations. Secondly, I'm interested in the ways in which the Julie Ward case and the discourses that it inspired offer a critique of colonial assumptions that continue to mediate metropolitan readings of contemporary Africa. Thirdly, I suggest that a reading of the interactions between local particularities and conventional, quote unquote, universal epistems can offer important insights into interactions between Africa and the rest of the world, and the accompanying patterns of collaboration, contestation, and complicities in these interactions. So Julie Ward's murder happened at the intersection of multiple spaces and discourses, which influenced the kinds of ideas, anxieties, and prejudices that came to be articulated through the case. My work draws on Mary Louise Pratt's concept of contact zones as what she describes as social spaces where disparate cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in highly asymmetrical relations of domination and subordination. And subordination. So this murder and the subsequent quest for truth and justice convened multiple zones of contact, among others between the tourist and the host, between Kenya and Britain, between the world family and the Kenyan state institutions on the one hand and on the other the British state institutions, and also between official and unofficial terrains, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about for the rest of um, my presentation. So the contact zone between official and unofficial terrains was particularly intriguing and produced a range of rumors and speculations on the matter, as I mentioned. Official attempts to frame the death as an act of God signaled an interest in precluding human culpability. For Kenyan publics, Dr. Kaviti's alterations on a legal document written by a colleague who had concluded that this was a murder case became suspect. In addition, the various sets of official quote-unquote truths lacked coherence, making them suspect in a case where logic and credibility were indispensable. Given that Dr. Shaker's autopsy revealed attempts to ban the remains after decapitation, the suicide theory lost credibility while traces of fuel in the incinerated remains ruled out both an attack by wild animals and lightning. So in this environment of suspicious official truths, and given similar attempts in the past to cover up high profile murders in Kenya, Kenyan publics following the case actively sought, created, and circulated their own versions of truth through rumors. Rumor is a highly ephemeral medium. However, the rumors about Julie Ward's death have found their way into the printed page over the years, largely through newspaper reports, alleged eyewitness accounts, and anonymous calls and notes addressed to her father. And my work mainly relies on these written records of the rumors on the case. These rumors were very much embedded in the social political climate of the time during the repressive Moi regime of the 1980s and the 1990s. Etienne Odiambo historicizes rumors as alternative avenues that grow in the vacuum left by the criminalization of organized oppositional politics on the one hand and the co-option of state institutions in the service of a select political agenda on the other. For him, rumor mongering is one of the informal oppositional institutions in Kenya which grant ordinary citizens a democratic space to express various forms of social political consciousness with some degree of impunity. 
According to James Scott, domination experienced systematically over a period of time by a group of people results in hidden transcripts which bear the marks of collective scripting insofar as they express shared sentiments and as such become collective cultural repositories of shared social truths. It's this fluidity of hidden transcripts as highly mobile, innovative texts that enables them to archive a whole range of interpretations of experiences. In our case, one can map out specific motifs in the rumors regarding Julie Ward's murder. And these include the notion that she stumbled upon either a drug ring, a poaching ring, or a private militia training in the Mara. The fact that the murder may have started out as a rape, and thirdly, the possibility that she was a spy, a British spy, who had sensitive information acquired through a close relationship with a politician. The murder is therefore read as the elimination of a woman who either knowingly or inadvertently knew too much and posed a threat to the political elite. So one ubiquitous feature in all these rumors is the involvement of a criminal political elite, or more specifically, what in Kenyan parlance is termed the big politician. The big politician is a common figure in Kenyan social imaginaries and can be traced back to the repressive one-party state during the Moi regime and further back to the 1960s Kenyatta regime in Kenya. Deeply rooted in patronage relations, the big, the big politician was believed to command so much power as to border on the untouchable, enjoying a comprehensive immunity guaranteed by his un uninhibited access to state institutions and resources. This figure, who was invariably male, embodies the blatant personalization of state power in post-independent Kenya. So rumor, or what um, Stephen Ellis has called pavement radio, following the francophone version, Radio Trattoir, mediates a powerful contestation of truth claims associated with state institutions. Far from being specific to Kenya, the suspicion of formal sites of truth production is a widespread phenomenon across the continent, where the truths, quote unquote, circulated in the rumor mill sometimes enjoy greater popular legitimacy than those produced by state institutions. While truth is conventionally legitimized by verifiable facts, rumor gains its legitimacy from precisely the suspect nature of officially produced truths, especially in cases where official institutions and processes are open to manipulation, as was the case with the word murder. And I've given you the two examples of the autopsy report and claims um, about suicide. So it was there, it therefore, rumor therefore operates on a different index of credibility, which, as Louise White has noted, lays greater store on truths perceived to be credible to the group in question. So in my work then, in using rumor as a source of social truths, I'm interested in local constructions of meaning regarding the murder and how the case became a repository of Kenyan social truths, while simultaneously enabling them to critique a repressive local regime. The rumors about the Julie Ward case reveal how Kenyans were able to filter through available information about the death and weave their own interpretations and analysis, which provided a forum to debate issues ranging from abuses of state power, the place of race and gender in Kenyan imaginaries, among other issues. As responses to official truths, the rumors represented an important process of reconfiguring conventional regimes of truth and evidence privileged by modern state institutions, which were considered to be compromised. These rumors saw the murder as yet another instance of a criminal political elite's brutal disregard for the lives of those deemed threatening to their interests. Julie Ward's death then became symptomatic of a predatory state Far from being illogical, these rumors worked within their own logics and rationalities, which were founded on a critical engagement with aspects of local realities. Yet at the same time, it's important to note that this incrimination of the state did not necessarily translate to sympathy with the Ward family. So these rumors saw no contradiction between incriminating the political elite and revealing in a sensational portrait of Julie Ward as a woman of loose sexual mores. In closing, I must underline that beyond the academic project here, it's hard to forget the brutal murder at the center of this discussion. And my consistent hope has been that my book is not only a defensible intellectual project, but that it reflects a fair engagement with the human tragedy of Julie Ward's brutal murder and the betrayal of the quest for justice for the Ward family and for the many other families of those who were murdered both before and after Julie Ward. Thank you.
That was actually fascinating, Grace, really. Uh, the last speaker is Margaret O'Mara, who's an associate professor of history at the University of Washington, even though she writes about things that are actually quite contemporary. So she's gonna resolve that paradox for us in her talk. She was the 2014 Frederick Borchardt Residential Fellow for recently tenured scholars, and she spent that time at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, where she's working on her current book project, Silicon Age, High Technology and the Reinvention of the United States, 1970 to 2000. She held an, uh, she had a, um, she got an MA, PhD in history from Penn and a BA in history and English from Northwestern. Uh, she's in her previous life, which actually turns out not to be so previous, seems to be a little current too, she was a staff member to uh, President Clinton and Vice President Al Gore. And I think this probably was a stimulus for a book that is just emerging, Pivotal Tuesdays for Elections that Shaped the 20th Century. This followed her dissertation, which I think is the uh, basis of, uh, or actually book, Cities of Knowledge, Cold War Science and the Search for the Next Silicon Valley. But I think she's going to talk to us today about her current project that she was working on as a Borchardt Fellow. So welcome, Margaret. Thank you so much for that introduction, and I have very two um, big acts to follow. Uh, but as I was sitting here listening to the earlier presentations, I was thinking about the, the beautiful connective tissue that cuts across some of the questions that we're asking, and the connective tissue across disciplines. Um, before, I decided, um, before I decided to double major in history and English, I was just an English major, and before that I wanted to be an art history major. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, even as a historian, I'm intensely interested in visual, um, investigating the visual and, and, and explicating visual presentations and understanding the histories behind that, and also the role of discourse and narrative in shaping um, broader perceptions of um, and, and, shaping, and shaping structure and shaping institutions as well. So I first must thank the ACLS and all the people involved with it and all the people in this room for um, the extraordinary opportunity that I was given through the Burkhart Fellowship. Um, I am um, having, I've had this extraordinary year at CASBIS um, at Stanford, and since I am working on a topic um, that is, uh, I'm, I'm right there with my sources, um, both the, my human sources and, and my archival sources. I'm in the alarming, uh, I, I, I'm in the state where, um, that makes most historians quake, it really makes me quake, that now I'm, I'm writing about people who are still with us on this earth. Um, and I'm used to, I'm very comfort, comfortable writing about people who are long past. Um, so this has been a very interesting project. So uh, humanists of all disciplines have the immense power to recast narratives, to, um, to paraphrase Apple Inc., to think differently. Um, I like to think that we um, can often politely, sometimes combatively, but, but um, correct misinformation with good information well considered and compellingly presented. And, and my work, and again, I think this is the connective tissue that crosses over all three of our work that, that we present this morning, is I'm very interested in the kind of the historically evolving relationship between structures of political power and structures of capitalism. And how ideas and discourses inhabit and shape these spaces. And so this project is that I'm working on is a book that I'm casting as a political and social history of the high-tech revolution. Um, it's a history that has been a history, a, a high-tech revolution and its de facto capital, Silicon Valley, a very distinctive place. Um, some might say I'm tilting at windmills, but that would make me a good humanistic scholar, wouldn't it? Um, but I think bringing a, a humanistic sensibility to the story of the high-tech digital revolution means one, asking, we bring, ask different questions. Two, we use different sources and methods. It's not just algorithms and big data, although those have a place as well. And as a result, 
we make different discoveries. Um, I feel like my job is, uh, you know, Silicon Valley is all about disrupti disruption, right? Well, I'm, I'm a disruptor. <laughs> I'd like to disrupt and demythologize the, the way that Silicon Valley is understood, not with the intent of throwing cold water on the whole enterprise and not with the intent of de devaluing the extraordinary technological achievements. Um, many of us have cell phones in our pockets right now that have the computing power of a $5 million supercomputer that took up um, that was larger than the size of this ballroom 50 years ago and cost $5 million 50 years ago. Um, but in, in opening up and expanding the horizons of what it means to be an innovator and, and, what, um, and what the, pro the process of, of um, economic change and political change, who has participated in it, who has driven it, who has benefited from it, and what the other possibilities might be going forward. So, this is a familiar scene. The late Steve Jobs was famous for his spectacular product announcements. Um, he was someone who understood the power of narrative and storytelling. And in a way, the images like this really sum up how the, the popular conception of what Silicon Valley is and who made Silicon Valley. The iconoclastic, genius entrepreneur selling products in a competitive marketplace, creating whole new demand structures, altering com consumer perceptions and preferences. Cool, hip, aspirational, rich. <laughs> and Silicon Valley is extremely influential. It is, it is, all, it is all those things. Um, but it is not the product of lone geniuses. And I think Steve Jobs would, would, ag would agree that he did not do it alone. Um, but because um, I, I think Silicon Valley is important as a topic, not because it's just an object of public fascination, but that it is so large and influential. Silicon Valley-based technology companies now are some of the biggest companies in the world. The products that they develop are um, uh, inflect, you know, I, I'd like everyone to start counting right now how many times it, in this day they're going to encounter a product or a platform made by Google, Facebook, or Twitter. And um, even those of us who are re resolute in saying, I'm not going to go on those things, it's very hard to, to avoid them in today's world. Now, the United States now has more than 1,100 computers for every 1,000 people. Um, so we are, we are all um, part of this high-tech revolution. So how do we understand this as, um, how do we understand its history? How do we understand where we go from here? Um, and, even because of this ubiquity, you know, it's interesting because Silicon Valley has a, has a very, very particularized mythology, and it's kind of a lone cowboy mythology. It's a very alluring one. It's one that has very, very deep roots in American history. Um, and in many Silicon Valley titans are outspoken in their disdain for government intervention. Libertarian sympathies run very, very strong among the high-tech rank and file. And media coverage of the uh, scrappy startups and their hot charismatic CEOs reinforce the idea that technology success comes from a willingness to take risks and break the grown-ups' rules. Um, and even inside the valley, it's, it, it, there's, this is, um, you know, these, these ideas run, are, are very, very well entrenched. And people who've been around the valley for a very long time and perhaps, you know, one would think have a, have a more um, seasoned perspective or still don't quite know how this, all this magic came about. I was talking to um, one of them who's been around for, for quite a few decades, and he said, well, it's just all the losers came here, and by some miracle they pulled it off. Um, so the reality, this is, this is part of the, we're, we're seeing through a glass darkly. We're seeing a piece of this larger story, and there's a bigger story here. And here's one way to entry into this bigger story. So let me go back to another guy who was known for making good speeches. And this is, um, this is Ronald Reagan when he made his first trip to Moscow in 1988, toward the end of his presidency. Um, and it was a historic visit, as those of you remember, you know, it was the, the, the high point of Perestroika and Glasnost, and he goes and has, you know, a big convivial dinner at Gorbachev's dacha, and he's, and, you know, there are people lining the streets of Moscow to see his motorcade. And at, towards the end of his visit, he gives a speech at Moscow State University, which is the premier technical university. 600 students are crowded into this stuffy auditorium. Um, this visual is an advanced man's nightmare, um, you know, a politician, right? <laughs> 
so, so apparently Reagan's advance team, the, the guys who make sure that everything looks pretty, right, um, had, had tried you know, to no avail for days to try and get something else in the background, but there, there you are. So here is Reagan making this historic visit. He has a grand opportunity to make the case for American-style democracy. And when he began to speak, he did, not, um, he did not talk about the things that we might think he would have talked about. He did not invoke the Founding Fathers. He did not even talk about mourning in America. He talked about the microchip. He said, standing here before a mural of your revolution, I want to talk about a different revolution that is taking place right now quietly sweeping the globe without bloodshed or conflict. Its effects are peaceful, but they will fundamentally alter our world, shatter old assumptions, and reshape our lives. It has been called the technological or information revolution, and as its emblem, one might take the tiny silicon chip, no bigger than a fingerprint. I'm never gonna speak quite as eloquently as Ronald Reagan, but you get the idea. So he's really, in the, and he goes on in the speech to really position the high-tech revolution as this kind of emblem of free market capitalism, of American-style democracy and the, the, the bounty of the market all wrapped up in one. And as with any method, had a grain of truth. Um, you know, that the, certainly you have, uh, it was these entrepreneurial success stories, these, these young guys who start companies in their garages that go on to be these giant um, multi-million dollar enterprises. You have Hewlett and Packard, you have Jobs and Wozniak. Um, and, but Reagan left out some really important parts. One was that the, the real, um, the, the first venture capitalist for the, uh, for the computer industry was the federal government, that public spending was the foundation for um, what these young um, entrepreneurs were able to do. And in fact, that was not just something that had happened in the past, but was very much going on in the present and continues to go on. But yet this is something this bigger picture has dropped out, and I think it's a two-way street. Not only do, does Silicon Valley think of itself as something apart from the rest of American society or a product of this sort of magical thinking and magical processes that go away from it, and, and, and consequently, that should be in the business of disrupting existing institutions rather than thinking about how they're a product of them. But the, the rest of American, you know, Amer you know the way that, that we write about American history often has, you know, a, a narrative where, the, where Silicon Valley is off to the side. Um, where we talk about the period from the late 1960s forward and talk about economic changes, social changes, political changes, and then have a paragraph that's, oh, and meanwhile, a lot of Northern California, there were some electronics companies that were doing this, that, and the other. And then we move on. My work, what I'm trying to do in this book is integrate the two narratives to really change the, and, and in doing so, disrupt <laughs> some ideas about these, these very deeply held ideas about these guys did it by themselves. So where this project fits in, I think this fits into some, you know, this is a very contemporary project. Uh, this is a, uh, but I, I am, you know, really responding to and trying to fit into um, ongoing and very vital debates in the humanities and the humanistic social sciences. Um, and really this is a, product, a project about capitalism, capitalism as embedded in social and political processes, and thinking about states and markets and how they interact with one another. Um, and also using commodities, I kind of think akin to, to Sylvia's work, using commodities as a lens through which to understand a broader history, and to look very at the, sort of look at the granularity of the local and how local cultures and histories are reshaping um, global markets, and 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 sometimes and and how those those two things transit between the two. I think the other thing, the place that I come in, and I think where a lot of people in this room and a lot of disciplines represented by the people in this room are very interested is, is not just the history, not only history from the bottom up, but also how the people at the top are, um, are how, how the, the discourses, the belief systems of elites, whether they be business elites or political elites, are um, shaping institutions and shaping um, society. So I have three big 
interventions, disruptions, to overuse this term, um, in my book. And, and this is a project that I not only want to do to intervene in the histori historiography, but also to reach broader audiences. And so I'm thinking, thinking in those broader terms. Well, one is the simple fact that the US government was there all along. Um, and it's, uh, you know, the, the story of the military, military spending, Cold War spending um, in, from 1950 forward um, is, is one that I think is, is become familiar and kind of percolated out into the culture. Yes, there was a connection. You know, the internet was, the origins of the internet were the ARPANET, et cetera. Um, and my first book was very much about that, that sort of up to that 1970 period. But there were other things going on as well. The federal government was, you know, you not only had the military, you had the space program. Um, and the space program had this, created this demand for very, very intricate, very high tech, very expensive, small electronic equipment that small companies um, in Northern California were very um, well positioned to, to provide. And so that the government has been there all along to say that that, that this is this is a, something that's the past tense is not is not not correct and it makes a bit broader case for why for why government is you know is is not inseparable from market forces. The second thing that I'm really interested in connecting is going back to this taking these two separate narratives. Like I said, we have our, our story of things falling apart in the night post 1970 period in the United States. Um, and then we have our story of the high-tech revolution. And those are two narratives that often don't connect with one another. And I, in connecting those, uh, one thing that, one argument I'm making is that, you know, and this is perhaps something I learned because my very first job out of college was working on a presidential campaign. And I realized that pres people don't win elections. They just win because the other person loses. And so did Silicon Valley win the election, so to speak, because of everything else falling apart? And my answer to that is, well, yes. And, and I come to that answer by looking at the di different sorts of sources than other, others might have. I look, at, I look at textual sources. I look at media discourses and how the, um, one of the things that, I, that, that, that my ACLS fellowship allowed me to do was <laughs> it, this fall I took advantage of my CASBIS um, Stanford library privileges and I ordered four years of back issues of Business Week that were bound, they were all in the off-site storage from the library. And I sat in the, library, in, in the on-site library there and paged through these actual magazines to just get a sense of what was going on, this 1978 to 1982. And is paging through these, these magazines, it's, boy, bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. You know, Business Week was a weekly publication then, back in the glory days of you know, publishing. Uh, 120 pages every week. Whew, it was a lot. And um, factory closings, steel, coal, auto, everything, you know. And then you get to the little section that's information processing, which is where computer and hardware software was, was encapsulated. And it is sunshine and poolside frolicking and happy, happy, happy and up, 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 up. And so the, putting those two things together helps us understand how these high tech companies flew so high, how the magical thinking of Silicon Valley became something that perhaps inflected a broader, uh, broader elite culture, how politicians started saying, aha, this is going to be our. This is going to be the answer. We need to encourage this growth. This is the symbol of free enterprise. How can we alter political institutions to um, enable the rise of these new companies? And these are politicians of both parties. And so, really, where I get to is my in my sort of third intervention here is thinking about Silicon Valley's ascent as redefining American capitalism and American politics. That not only did the was the federal government. Silicon Valley and the tech industry's first venture capitalist by creating this foundational um, um, sort of all these resources to spur research development and commercialization. But on the flip side, you have um, at the same time, you have both a Republican Party and a Democratic Party, but the two major, major national parties redefining themselves, new leadership emerging, and very much being um, sort of aligning themselves with this new economy. Um, and that helps, I, I think this informs a whole bunch of questions, unanswered questions that we have about the state of our political system and, our, and, and again, the relationship between capital and the state. And here's, you know, one data point. Um, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> 
we have, and, and, and Bush would have higher if he'd had two terms to talk about entrepreneurs. And I didn't go all the way to Obama because even though I go to the, you know, pretty close to the present, that's, that's alarmingly present tense. But, but here we have this sort of discursive shift in the way that American political leadership is talking about business and talking about to what um, people, young people included, including the people we teach, should aspire. Um, we now um, teach classrooms full of people who are being told that everyone should aspire to be an entrepreneur, to start their own startup. Well, gosh, that's a lot of startups. Um, who's going to work for the man? Um, <laughs> so the last point I want to make in this is, is that culture and ideas matter. And again, going to you know where, where do humanistic approaches, humanistic disciplines fit in these broader public debates, and, and also in understanding, historicizing the, um, the, the modern America. Um, we're now, you know, in the, uh, the internet is, you know, the, the PC is in its middle age, the internet is, um, is, is getting older. We, we now are, you know, a, a several decades into the, to the high-tech revolution. Um, and, and so here's an example, you know, of something in the news, the, the, the incredible gender imbalance in high technology. Um, and racial imbalances. Um, but the big consumer-facing Valley companies released very dispiriting numbers last year um, about the numbers of women and minorities, African Americans, Latinos, in their technical workforces. And um, women of all races, the percentage was about, hovered around 17% um, engineers at places like Google and Facebook. And why is that, you know? Well, you know, we can, um, you know, we can understand these headlines um, by, this is a really powerful example of how humanistic sources and methods can provide an explanatory framework, um, historicizing it. You know, first, compu women computer programmers, the first computer programmers um, were women. Um, here, just, you know, a couple miles away, um, ENIAC being created, created at the University of Pennsylvania during World War II, um, the, the real, you know, the, the real skill in computing was, was the hardware, right? The thought was the, the tough stuff is building the computer. Programming the software is just like being a telephone operator or a secretary. A woman can do that. It's just putting plugs in. And what was not recognized was that software, you know, software can be buggy. <laughs> software is actually, programming software is, is a very, it, it's, it's, it's an art. It, it is something that requires a great deal of thought and skill. And it requires sort of creative thinking and, and processes. And so, so as computer programming became more highly valued both in terms of its um, the sort of intellectual and intellect and skills needed for it, and the money associated with those professions, it becomes progressively more male. But that's not all. If you look, like looking at his, you know, where where do computers move in when they're when it, when the PC is becoming a commodity product? It's um, you know, personal computers are marketed exclusively to men in the early years. Apple computers marketing plans um, for their first several generations of computers were all of their target audiences were entirely male. Um, that when they finally, um, when the Mac started, uh, they started marketing to college students, they, there were some women in the mix there because they realized women go to college. But, but you had, you know, the, the, the first personal computers were marketed to, to um, high income um, college educated men because that was where the, those, those are who understood as who you bought and used computers. When computers first went into class, went into schools, where did they go? Into the math classroom, into the basement shop, into male, to boys territory. And then there's a whole cultural dimension of how pop culture created the computer nerd and, uh, and really presented this image that was an entirely, a very highly gendered image. So here's an example of a very contemporary question that humanists are very well equipped to answer in a really rich way, in a, really, in a way that, that gets people to understand this is actually how you might change things and how things might be different. So I will leave it there. Thank you all again for this incredible opportunity to do what I do. Um, I think I, along with the other panelists, so grateful for the ACLS and for everything it does for humanistic scholarship. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, and thanks for telling us why the humanities matter even in this kind of thing, yay. So uh, I'm here to ask for questions of our different panelists. I'm sure you have many. So please forge ahead. Yes. This is for Professor O'Mara. When I was listening to the end of your presentation, I was struck with parallels between your research and... and uh, Sorry. 
I was struck with parallels uh, between your research and uh, uh, Professor Limerick's uh, work on the American West, mm -hmm. Legacies of Conquest. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she uh, took on the image of the West as the land of rugged individualists and depicted it as a bunch of dependent whiners who were calling on the federal government to protect them from Indians, to subsidize transcontinental railroads, et cetera. And, and uh, again, the picture uh, uh, that we have of, the, of the, the nerdy individualist who built Silicon Valley and you, and you giving us a, a new view on that, again, I, I, I see is parallels there. I guess that's not really a question, but uh, a connection. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a good per, that's good company to be uh, keeping. Thank you. <laughs> Any other observations or questions? Yes. It's a question about rumor, and you described it as a source of social truth and as a democratic space, as a contestatory space to power. And as I thought of that, I thought about how much governments or power itself propagate rumor is a tool of the state in the same way. And it was just a conflict in my mind when I was thinking of, well, rumor, as you described it, contests power but so often power itself propagates rumor mm -hmm. to get their way. Mm -hmm. You had any reflection on that? Um, thank, thank you for that. Yes, actually, um, that was the case as well in my work that, and long before my work actually, that in Kenya we've heard rumor is sort of a mutual space for both the state and ordinary people. But the question is what the two different constituencies um, use it for. So in our case, um, there have been many instances when the state actually uses rumor precisely to sabotage more uh, progressive and democratic views. But um, what's interesting there is a way in which ordinary citizens are alert to that. So even as they're using rumor, they're very clear on the distinction between their use of rumor and the state's use of rumor as well. So I completely agree with you there, definitely. I wonder, um, you have to wait for the mic, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you all three so much. This was, they were just fascinating. And I wondered if the three of you might reflect on what seems to be what, a shared sense of the way scale plays across your work. I'm fascinated by the ways in which the granularity of the local, as Margaret put it, opens up a different set of kind of political questions or social or questions for the humanists to consider. And I wonder if the three of you, with this really powerfully imagined set of works, I just congratulate all of you, this was fascinating to listen to, could think um, together about the ways in which scale seems to be a central concern for all of us right now, and whether scale, in fact, opens up opportunities for inquiry for humanists across disciplines, and really what the three of you are sort of doing and listening to each other uh, with ideas about scale. <laughs> Sylvia. Sylvia, go, Sylvia. Thank you. I think, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point, and I think that came up a lot across the, all of our talks. Um, and I think that, that the, the challenge of looking across scale is the, um, the sort of the losses that happen at each level. Um, so I, I sort of recognize fully that by looking at the local in, in this textile trade, um, I've missed out on studying certain kind of phenomenal um, uh, instances of global interconnectedness of the 17th century. Um, but I think one thing that I've, I've been really um, surprised by and excited by is the awareness of scale even at this earlier historical moment. Um, and that the, it's not just my humanistic conceit that, that these are operating at different scales, but um, you know, the fact that in, in early American merchant lists, um, the cloths were identified by the very city that they came from, not the country or not the, even the sort of empire that they came from, but the city itself. Um, and so this knowledge about local production um, that we've actually lost now, um, you know, that, that, that the label of made in Bangladesh means so much less to us now than it did then um, is, is something that I see as a kind of, yeah, as a loss and something that 
humanistic study can kind of work to recover. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. I think it's really interesting to think about, and I agree with you that it cuts across all our work. In my particular case, um, it plays out in terms of the interactions between what one might call micro-narratives and the macro-narratives. And I try in the book, I hope successfully, but um, I'll hear from the readers, but I try to track those um, intersecting and sometimes very much colliding strands of larger discourses around um, international relationships, around these two governments and their interests, and then around a small person, that this was a murder of an ordinary person who, for all sorts of reasons, these two governments considered dispensable by the ways in which the different constituencies and small ordinary people who will never make news, they will never matter in the larger scheme of things, are able to engage with those grand and um, grand meta narratives and articulate their views in their own ways. So I keep I try to track um, both those large stories, but also the small micro narratives as well. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I was I in both of your work that's that I think it's they, it's a testament to how um, the. For one, you can, by looking at, lo at the local, um, how I was struck, we were sort of talking about the value of, you know, it comes, the, the, the cachet attached from being from a, a Muslim being from a certain place, and how that falls away and then becomes devalued as a synonym for cheapness. So you have this very particularized local um, phenomenon that is a window into these broader currents of power and colonialism and, um, Attitudes about race, race and ethnicity, and um, and and value, and and it's so so that's and and then I I was also struck by how you how local power structures the local problems the dealing with the um, that this event that's a global event that involves an international um, uh, a lot of international actors actually becomes a way for local people to be agents using it as an agent of change for for regional and local problems. So these, and in a way, I, I hope that what, what I try to do in my work, one of the things that, um, I'll be quite honest, I don't think there's any, I don't think any of these people are in this room, maybe they'll be watching this video. But there's, you know, there's a very, very big, um, uh, uh, you know, global community of, of people, including scholars, who are highly interested in kind of innovation economies and how you grow innovation elsewhere, right? And, um, and a lot of it is, um, well, there are two things that, that I, I think, you know, where a humanistic perspective could intervene in that conversation. One is the sort of the granularity of the local, um, uh, which is that, you know, I, I have a lot of people coming to me and say, how do you build a next Silicon Valley? And um, I have a very, very dispiriting answer for them, which is, it's, you know, it's hard and it involves history and it's very complicated. Um, and, and, but there's this assumption that you can just pick up and, you know, build another one if you put enough money into it. And looking at the local and, and looking at the, the historical evolution of these, these very sort of complex factors gives you an appreciation for, for what the recipe really is. And, um, and then the other thing about the, the global conversation about um, economic growth and development, and it's also carried on by a lot of NGOs and supranational, and, you know, there's a lot of money being, and public resources being spent, um, and well, lots of well, you know, well-meaning int intended people. Um, a lot of it is kind of the some, sometimes 30,000 foot view, maybe occasionally the 5,000 foot view of the way things work on the ground. And, and I think all three of our projects are intensely interested in kind of the way things work on the ground. I'm intensely interested in the particular business culture that emerges in Silicon Valley in a particular time and place and how that gets disseminated and becomes the new model for, for a whole host of other places, both, both nationally and globally. I just thought of one thing, which is that one of the only made-in objects that every iPhone has the weather for Cupertino. <laughs> <laughs> and just thinking about it. I'm afraid we've actually run out of time. I know, right? But I encourage you to continue with your questions of them at the coffee period. <laughs>